First of all, I want to thank you, Pastor, for the encouragement. Let's go with it one day, for the encouragement. And uh, I want to thank uh, Sister Naomi also for her encouraging words this morning. And I want to thank my daughter for her encouraging words yesterday. And uh, this is about the Lord. And I prayed over this message and hope it'll go over well because it's not to glorify me, but it's to glorify the Lord. Amen. And uh, there was a song that we, my sister Linda put up this morning and it was The Great I Am. That's what I'm gonna be talking about this morning. The Great I Am. Amen. And uh, the, uh, there was seven declarations that Jesus declared talking about himself when he used the words, I am. And uh, those declarations can be found in John, they all, all seven of them. And um, we're gonna go into this and find out what Jesus meant in each instance that he said that he used the words, I am. Bottom line was, he was saying that he was God. That's exactly what he was saying, that he was God. And we're going to start with Jesus answering a question of the Pharisees. And they asked him, who do you think you are? Or in another translation, who are you? When they put up, uh, no, not yet, I'm sorry. Who do you think you are and what are you? And, and uh, Jesus said this in John, put up John 8, 56 through 59. Amplify it. Your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at the hope and prospect of seeing my day, my incarnation. I remember that, my incarnation. And he did see it and was delighted. Next verse. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Next verse. Before I go any further, they asked that question, but they really didn't realize what they was asking. Jesus replied, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Go to the next verse. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus, by mixing with the crowd, concealed himself and went out of the temple, and went out of the temple enclosure. Okay. So, they picked up stones to stone him to death because he answered their question. He answered their question, he answered it truthfully. He didn't lie, he answered it truthfully. So why did they pick up the stones and want to become violent? Well, they did that because of his answer when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. That I am, what they realized and what they understood was that Jesus was equating himself with God. He was saying that I am God. And during that time, if you said something that wasn't true, they call that, especially that, it was blasphemy. And at the, in the, in the Mosaic, Mosaic law, blasphemy would be handled by death. So they wanted to stone him to death. But I can assure you, our Savior did not commit blasphemy. Amen. He was and is God Almighty. Amen. And he was telling them the truth. But see, what they didn't realize was that their Messiah had already come. They didn't, and they, they didn't realize that. Anyway, Jesus was equating himself with that same I am title that God gave himself at the burning bush. He said to Moses, I am who I am. You shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So if Jesus had wanted to say that he existed before Abraham time, he would have said before Abraham, I was. 
You follow me? Okay, I was. But instead, he said, before Abraham, I am. Now, the Greek word translated was, in the case of Abraham, and am, in the case of Jesus, are different. The words chosen by the Spirit. Now, this, these words that in this Bible here was chosen by the Spirit of God. Man wrote it, but it was chosen by the Spirit of God. So these words were chosen by the, the Spirit, made it clear that Abraham, in other words, was brought into being. Jesus, am, existed eternally. Okay, so Jesus existed eternally. Can you prove that? Yes, I can. One day, put up John 1 and 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, when is that? Before all time, was the Word. What was the Word? The Word was Christ. And the Word, Christ, was with God. And the Word was God himself. There's the proof right there. In John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus was who he said he was. But they didn't understand that because they were looking in the natural. Because we as Christians, we know that this Bible right here is true in every respect. So that's our proof right there in John 1 and 1. So there's no doubt that the Jews understood what he was saying because they took up the stones and they was going to try to kill Jesus. Because he was saying that he was equal to God. That messed them all up. Because to make a statement like that, like I said before, it was blasphemy. But Jesus, he's God. He's the second person in the Godhead. And he's equal to God in every respect, in every way. Jesus used that same phrase, I am, like I said before, in seven, seven other decorations. And uh, I'm going to read them to you. I am the bread of life, and that's found in John 6, 35, 41, and 48, and 51. I am the light of the world, John 8, verse 12. I am the door of the sheep, John 10, 7, and 9. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11, and 14. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 and 6. I am the true vine, John 15 and 1 and 5. Now, the first one we're going to go over is what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. One yay, put up John 6, 35, please. And Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. And he who believes in and cleaves to me and trusts in and relies on me will never thirst anymore at any time. The bread. Let's talk about the bread. It, the bread played a, a very important part in the Jewish Passover. In, the, in that Passover meal. The bread, uh, the Jews were to eat that unleavened bread during the Passover feast, and then for seven days following the Passover as a celebration of their uh, exit out of Egypt, out of bondage. And during that time, after they came out of Egypt, they were wandering around in the desert for 40, 40 years. And God rained down bread from heaven. And that bread was to sustain the nation, which was called manna. That's what that bread was called. Now, all this plays into the scene when Jesus used the term bread of life. Now, remember when Jesus asked Philip, how are we going to feed this huge crowd? But then Philip displayed his little faith when he said, Lord, we don't have enough money 
to get food for all these people because the Bible says there was about 5,000 men. And they didn't say anything about women and children. So then there was Andrew. He brought this kid, little boy, and said, well, Lord, this kid has five loaves and two fish. So that's when Jesus looked up to heaven, gave thanks, and miraculously fed all those people. And the Bible says there was a lot left over after he fed all these folks. Okay, now with all this going on, the people were following Jesus from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. And they were following Jesus for one reason. They had seen his sign that he had performed. But he, Jesus, he accused the crowd of, of, uh, of uh, ignoring his miraculous sign and said they was only following him like for a free meal. You know, so Jesus broke it down this way. Why they put it down and put up uh, John 6 and 27. Stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes in the using, but strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give, furnish you, for God the Father has authorized and certified him to put his seal of endorsement up on him. Now, in other words, they were caught up with the food. They were missing out that Jesus was the Messiah. They were missing out on that. So they asked Jesus for a sign that he was sent from God. <laughs> wow. Jesus just walked on the water. He just fed all these people with practically nothing. And you want a sign? You know, you want a sign? But well, sometimes people are like that today. They want a sign before they believe. Well, if you want a sign, I can give you a sign. I can give you a few. He laid you down last night to go to sleep. But you want a sign. He woke you up this morning. But you want a sign. He woke you up in your right mind. But you want a sign. He put clothes on your back. But you want a sign. You got food to eat. You got bed to sleep in. You got a car. You got a little money in the bank. You got a little money in your pocket. But you want a sign. What do you think you got all this stuff? It come from God Almighty. It come from God. You didn't produce none of it. But you want a sign. It all come from God. We got to stop wanting a sign and start believing. We just got to believe that he is who he say he is that he does what he say he's going to do, yes. we got to believe that and stop asking for a sign. Signs are all around you. I'm not going to walk around here talking about, Lord, give me a sign. I see a sign every day. Every day that I get up, I see a sign. You know, I can look out there at the trees. I see a sign. I can look at the changing of the season. I see a sign. I don't need no sign, Lord, because you are my sign. Right. This is my sign right here. This word of God, this is the sign. Now the Jews took it a step further and they told Jesus that God gave them this manner when they were wandering in the desert. Jesus knew that. He was the one that did it. Anyway, but they were still missing what Jesus was trying to get them to ask for was the true bread from heaven. That bread that gives life. Not temporary bread but the bread that gives light. And he shook them up. Put up John uh, 6.35 again, one day. He really shook them up when he said, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty, for that one would be sustained spiritually. Now that was a phenomenal statement. A phenomenal statement. We're going to break that down. Okay, first of all, by equating himself with bread, Jesus is saying that he's essential for life. 
You can live on bread and water. But Jesus was saying he was essential for life. Second, the life Jesus is referring to is not physical life, but it's eternal life. Jesus was trying to get the Jews to stop thinking on the natural and think in the spiritual realm. Same thing the pastor's always telling us. Stop thinking on the natural. Walk in the spirit. And stop thinking on the natural. Stop always looking at things of the natural because uh, we're not natural beings. We are spiritual beings. Good example. The body ain't going to lead the spirit. The spirit is going to lead the body to decay. So we are spiritual beings, therefore we have to think in the spirit, speak in the spirit, walk in the spirit, see the spirit, all spiritual things. But Jesus was, was contrasting what he brings to the table as the Messiah with the bread he was actually created the day before, which was physical bread. Physical bread perish, perishes. It perishes. It's not eternal. That proved that when you eat it, it ain't no more. He was conveying to the Jews that he was spiritual bread that brings eternal life. Life that never perishes. Life that God intended for us from the beginning. The flesh is going to die. We know that. But the spirit in fl inside that flesh is going to live forever. The Bible says the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. It counts for nothing. You think that's why God allowed Jesus' flesh to be crucified instead of his spirit? Because the flesh counts for nothing, but the spirit is eternal. Pastor always tells us to let that flesh go to the cross. Let that flesh be crucified. Like Jesus' flesh was crucified. Because your spirit is the one that God is looking for. He ain't looking for your flesh. Your flesh is just housing the spirit. Once that spirit leaves, that flesh is going to die. Third thing, and very important, Jesus is making another claim of diet when he says, I am. The statement is the first I am statement in John's gospel. The phrase I am is a covenant name of God, Yahweh, which God revealed to Moses at that burning bush. I am self-sufficient. That's what that means. I am self-sufficient in my existence and in everything else. I am self-sufficient. And that's an attribute only God possesses. No human being possesses that, but Jesus, he possessed it because he was God. It's also the phrase the Jews were listening to that would have automatically understood as a claim of deity. Fourth, notice the words, come and believe. This is an invitation for those listening, you and I, to place our faith in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. So what does it mean to come to Jesus? Well, it involves making a choice to accept him as Lord and Savior and forsake the world and follow Christ. In other words, we followed the world long enough. Now it's time for us to follow Christ. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Believing in Jesus means we place our faith in him. And we believe he is who he say he is. We believe that he would do what he says he's going to do. And that is only he can do. Nobody else. Nobody else can promise you the things that God promises you. Nobody else can deliver on those promises that God has promised. Nobody else. 
fifth, the words hunger and thirst. Now, he's not talking about doing away with uh, physical hunger or physical thirst. Thirst. The key is found in another statement Jesus made on the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, when Jesus says those who come to him will never hunger and those who believe in him will never thirst, he is saying that he will satisfy our hunger and thirst to be made righteous in the sight of God. And ain't that what we all want, to be made righteous in the sight of God? But if we listen to religion, religious tells us something totally different. Religious, religion tells us that we can work our way to heaven. But faith tells us we can't. Heaven is eternal. And heaven is a basic desire because man, I mean, God created us with eternity, eternity in mind. When he created us, we were supposed to live forever. And we are, but during the fall, things change. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. And also he has planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. So we know, especially as Christians, that we're going to live forever if we follow Christ. That our spirit is secure. We won't be separated from God. But if we don't follow Christ and go the other way, we're going to be separated from God throughout eternity. We don't want that. We want to be with the creator after eternity, after eternity, after eternity. Amen. And he goes on to say, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Nothing but God can satisfy that longing that we have within our heart that God put there from the get-go to spend eternity with him. Nothing can satisfy that. The car can't satisfy it. The money in the bank can't satisfy it. The house can't satisfy it. Your, crop, your spouse can't satisfy it. Nothing can satisfy that hunger that we have in our heart but God Almighty himself. And it says, yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done, his overhaul plan, overall plan from the beginning to the end. Now that's awesome. Some things weren't meant for us to know. Like Pastor always says, we see in part. We understand in part. But when God reveals himself to her, us completely, we will know and understand completely. The Bible tells us that there is nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven. Not by works. Because the only thing that sin earns us is death. It states that in Roman, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, that is his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers is eternal life in Christ our Lord. And that's where Jesus came in at. Because when Christ died on that cross, he took all the sins of mankind upon himself and made atonement for all sins. Not some sins, but for all sins. So when we place our faith in him, our sins are imputed to Jesus. And his righteousness is imputed to us. Jesus satisfies our hunger and thirst for righteousness before God. Therefore, Jesus is our bread of life. Yes, sir. I, I want to say something just to follow up on that. People need a purpose. Have you ever notice that you have a purpose, you have something you want to accomplish, and you work at it, and 
and working at it, you, you begin to feel satisfied that you're doing something. And it seems like as you do that particular thing, you're, you're really being satisfied and satisfied. And, and, and that's good. I've experienced that many times. I've had many projects, many things that I've done. And as I'm doing it and I complete it, and it's like, wow, that gives me a satisfying feeling. How, how many can identify with that? Okay. And, and that's in the natural, and that, that's good. That's wonderful. You accomplish something. You, 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 uh, you go to college, and you, you're satisfied that you passed the test, and you got your uh, diploma, uh, you know, you, you, this and this. And, but we have to go from one thing to another to keep the satisfied thing operating in our lives. Now, I'm going to say something here now, and, and, and uh, some of you are still searching for it, and I'm not saying you're not saved, uh, that you don't love Jesus, and I know you do. But there comes a time, we used to sing this song, I am satisfied with Jesus. How many of you ever sang that song? Remember the song? How many remember the song? I'm satisfied with Jesus. But the question is, is Jesus satisfied with me? How many of you ever heard that song? Y'all ain't, ain't never heard that song? One, one, one. You would be the only one who's heard that song. Well, there's a song that says that. I, but I'm going to ask you a question. And it's not to put you down. Are you really satisfied in life? Are you still searching? Do you feel like you just haven't tapped onto it yet because... Because when you, when you accomplish things in the natural, you feel satisfied. You feel whole. You feel you like, I, I feel like I'm somebody. Now, don't let me get too deep here, but I'm trying to reach you. But there comes a point in your life, and some of you are still searching for it. Are you satisfied with Jesus? Well, I'll get married. That'll satisfy me. <clears throat> yeah, that's true for a while. And I'm glad I'm married and I am satisfied with my wife. But this satisfaction goes beyond the natural. It's in the spiritual. It's, it's, a, to, 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 it, it, it's that when you're satisfied with Jesus and you know that he is satisfied with you, you feel complete. You feel whole. You're not doing all this striving to do all the different things that to still trying to find that satisfaction. How many, how many in here have I lost so far? Let me see. How, how many begin to understand a little I'm saying? How many understand what I'm saying? One person, two, three, four. All right, I'm working at it because this is important. You can live all your life and not be satisfied have all the money, and I've seen people, all the money. Well, if I tell you what, if I could get that house, I'd be satisfied. Boy, if I get that new car, I'd be happy. Boy, if I, if I could marry that man, man, I'd be happy. Read my lips. Yes, you'll be happy for a while. But that yearning, that longing... Did you know all nature groans and longs for the sons of God to be manifested? There is a longing in all of our hearts that we don't understand, and we go after everything that we can. And I'm not saying a lot of those things are wrong. But until we can make that connection with God to the point Gosh, I even love myself now. <laughs> well, what a big step that is. You, you, get off, you get off your own shoulders. You feel complete. You see, when Adam sinned, and he, and they, they, they lost that completion. They lost that connection with God. And until you find it, I ain't talking about salvation here. I'm talking about a connection with God that whether things are bad or good, you're satisfied. Because you're satisfied with somebody that's eternal, that you know that, that, that he loves you, 
care what people say, nothing can change his mind not to love you. Well, I just put that before you. Talk to the Lord about it. Just talk to the Lord about it. And remember, he is the satisfaction from heaven. He is the bread of life. He is the great I am. He has always been and he shall always be. Amen. There is a connection with God in the spirit that, that God is drawing his people to himself. And it's amazing. You might not have a dime in your pocket and you're the most satisfied person in the world. And it's available for everybody. Wow. So how is it with your soul this morning? What has God said to you this morning? You know, this is a very important message, Willie, because there are some of uh, folks out there that believe that Christ was created by God they, they believe that um, Jesus and the devil are brothers. Yeah, there's religions out there that believe all that stuff. They don't understand that the great I am is God that created all things. And you read in Colossians chapter 2, it talks quite a bit about that. So, what is God saying to you? Hmm? Think about it. Let's bow our heads and, and talk to the Lord a little bit. Talk to the little board. Father, as we bow our heads and we just talk to you, show us in our lives that constant yearning, that constant desiring, that constant wanting and never being fulfilled. Lord, show us that we need to tap on to thee in a greater way and draw from thee, from thy word and from the living Lord, that eternal bread from heaven that satisfies our longing. Thank you, Father. That there'll come a day before we leave this planet that we can say, I am satisfied with Jesus. And may we say that Jesus is satisfied with us. Thank you, Father. People look and think it's in love. Well, if I'm loved by somebody, I'll be satisfied. No, all that's good within his place. But there's one thing that will bring us total, absolute well-being, wholeness. And that is to the point that we know that you are the great I am. And we want to thank you now that you've dealt with every heart. You've given us something to think about this afternoon. And Lord, we want to thank you now for the physical food we're about to receive. Thank you for every individual that's here.